Okay, so now instead of looking at spatial data, we're going to focus a little bit more on uh, raw data, or in this case, specifically weather data or climate data. Um, and so in order to do that with Rhino on Grasshopper, we're going to use the plugin uh, Ladybug. And again, you can get this from going to Food for Rhino and searching for Ladybug tools. So from here, as soon as you get that working and installed, um, we'll start off by using this first piece here. This basically just kind of prepares Grasshopper and makes sure it's running. Um, then the next thing we're going to do is download EPW weather files. So this is basically going to open up a window for us to find that weather data. So it takes us to this website and you can see just where uh, weather data is available. So luckily it's pretty accessible. And although you might not find the exact location, as long as you're within a pl close proximity, uh, you should be able to do that. So in this case, again, with Beatty, Nevada, it's just right over here. It's not too far, uh, but we can use data from here. You can actually either download this onto your computer or you can just simply copy the URL link. So I'm actually going to do that. So I'm going to click copy link to clipboard. Now I'm going to go back to Grasshopper. Do uh, open EPW and stat weather files. So now again, it's looking for that weather URL. So I'll just use this panel here and Double click, hit paste, there's my URL. This gives me an output of an EPW file. So now I'll do ladybug import EPW. And now, this again will take a second, but this is where we're gonna start to get all our information from. And, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of different outputs. So uh, longitude and uh, location dry bulb temperature, dew point temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, all sorts of great information that we can use to uh, map outdoor comfort and other conditions. So the rest of these tools are how you start to actually do that. Um, in this case, for doing just inventorying of information, we basically just want to look at each one of these kind of individually. So. Um, we can look at them at specific times of the year. Uh, we can look at the entire year and the fluctuations. It's really powerful uh, tool to look at weather data. So um, the best way to kind of start off is actually just looking at how you're going to visualize this. Um, for things like um, temperature variation, um, and other things you can use the 3d chart and then for things like humidity we can look at the psychometric chart so let's just start off using this ladybug 3d chart I skipped over this just because you'll see um, how that's useful for this so the first thing it's asking for is input data and a kind of rule to look at this to understand it anything that has an underscore to the left is required. Anything that has it on both sides is optional. Um, and then I'm not sure exactly what the um, correlation, if it's on the right hand side. Um, this is, I think, just kind of additional information you can provide. But what's crucial is if it has that underscore on the left, is that it's absolutely required. So for the first thing, we could just start off by looking at dry bulb temperature. So I'll input that. It's going to take a second. And let's look over here. So like I said, it creates a cool 3D chart of your system. If you want, you could always change the uh, Z scale factor to zero if you want to just read flat. You can obviously change the X and the Y as well. So it's kind of up to you. Um, so now that's what it looks like if it was just perfectly flat. Um, we can even start to affect um, conditional statements or parameters. So um, for temperature, you can start to say, you know what, like if it gets above 
a certain degree, um, um, we can start to filter it out. The thing to know what's coming out of here, and it's good, like they've got these really great descriptions of this information, is that it'll actually tell you what units it's in. So it's actually in Celsius um, instead of Fahrenheit. So I'm not really good at that conversion of understanding the difference, but luckily they've got some tools to help that. So if I go to extra, I can do ladybug C to F or Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, drag that now into there. That way I can actually start to filter it. And you'll see that the legend changes. So we know we can see our high is 111.2. Um, and then our low is 21.92. Um, so we could, and this is doing it for the entire year, if you want to filter it actually by a period of time, we can always go to ladybug um, analysis period. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like I can do it in here. So that's why I was uh, hesitant. Um, we can use it for other parts, you'll see, because again, like just looking at dry bulb temperature, that's not really a metric you use as a standalone thing. It's usually used to kind of understand other uh, conditions like uh, outdoor comfort. So um, that's where you actually start to include conditional periods as well as um, for other things. But anyway, let's stick with this. So we can actually filter out um, it by temperature now. So conditional statement, if I do in this case, if I want to look for temperatures above a certain threshold, I can do that or below. So let's just do, in this case, we're going to do A is greater than 80 degrees. Oops. And let's make sure in terms of like spacing. So it looks like we do need to have some spacing as well. So I'll do A is greater than 80. So let's try that. So now you can see our chart gets filtered out to just when it's above that 80 degrees. If you wanted to do it the other way, so less than, so looking at the colder temperatures, you can do that as well. So now we kind of see what that threshold is. So there's a lot of yellow, so maybe you even want to do something a little bit lower, like 65. And it's always going to... Uh, well, it's actually going to keep the legend, which is nice, so the color gradient kind of stays the same. You can see where it starts to kind of get into that blue, so maybe you start off with like uh, 48.7. So if it's about just kind of going off of that color gradient, you can always do it that way. And these are all coming out as meshes, so you can actually uh, bake these into rhino and have them as actual cells themselves. Um, in order to do that, you just run a boolean toggle to bake it. Um, let's again kind of continue to mess with this. So if you want to create a legend, you can always go to extra, do, um, where is it? Ladybug legend parameters. So Um, so there's ways to do that. Obviously, this kind of gives you that, but we could always actually filter out this data as well. So if I go to analysis, I can actually just look at ladybug uh, separate data. And so now I've got just the numeric values versus all that kind of information at the top. So if I looked at it this way, um, I can go to sets, or sorry, math, minimum and maximum, figure out what those upper and lower values are. 
So here's my low value, here's my large value. Um, how many segments do you want? Um, default is set to 11, so let's just stick with something like that. Um, custom colors, right? So this is where we can actually use color gradients. So let's do that now as well. So um, let's create a color gradient. And again, it's defaulted to 10 segments. So I would say whatever, um, you can kind of create your kind of segments this way. So I would actually do, I'd go to sets. Um, let's do a series. We can see that the start of the domain is, let's actually do a range. Actually, that'll be better. So I'll use this one. So this is looking at the high and the low, and now we can basically divide it by however many steps. So let's just do something again, like we'll just use a slider for 10. All right, so these are the increments we're gonna get. Um, if I want to, I could even just go to parameters and set these to integers for whole numbers. Okay, so now I've got, again, those same items. And now it just wants to know what those values would be. So in this case, I'm gonna use this as my T value for those integers. See something different. I mean, that's kind of a default one, but we could always use this color as well. If I do this for number of segments there, and then here's my custom colors. And now I can plug this into my legends parameter. This again will take a second. <clears throat> so yeah, now we've got our, we've adjusted it to match whatever this color gradient. So I can always change that to something maybe like this for the cooler colors. Maybe that makes more sense. Okay. So we can, so you can start to customize that as well. Um, the next thing, and if you want, like see how, like even though we're filtering everything out, um, starting at 48. So what we could do also is say, you know what, just create a uh, bounds between this lowest value and 50. And we'll also use that, actually, so we'll do create a new uh, domain. So now it's 21.92 to 50, so that'll be this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just disable this, so every time I do something, it doesn't affect it. So this is my new domain. Um, this is the new high bounds. So it's getting a little messy here, but don't worry. Um, so let's just unlock it. Um, oops, and then I forgot to also include that 50 over here as our upper. So it's still reading 111 as the highest one. So let's just do that. And that should cover give us more of a gradient. There we go. Obviously, I mean, I don't know if white's necessarily appropriate for this, so we could always right click. Maybe that's more of a blue or cyan color. It's really take really struggling right now, so think as it's even thinking this way. So 
So I'm just going to settle with this color so it's not forever. Oh, maybe that works. Come on. Uh, so Ladybug does take a little bit of a toll on your computer in terms of uh, processing and memory use. So um, keep that in mind. I think we're finally got a decent color instead of it just being a white. Yeah, so you can see every time I'm adjusting that, it's reprocessing it. So if you even just even editing the colors inside of this is going to reprocess it each time. Okay, so this is again like how you can start to just look at, in this case, uh, dry bulb temperature. We've set those conditions to a cool temperature. Let's look at some other things. So go back to ladybug let's look at uh, psychometric chart so I'm just gonna drop this or bring it all the way up there so you'll see again what information it needs so dry bulb temperature again I'm gonna use it in Fahrenheit relative humidity so I'll drag that into there if you want to add um, I don't know if we get the barometric pressure for this, so I'm just going to, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, we can even include things like for humidity, um, I wouldn't worry too much about wind speed, but it again can be something we use. Um, and then this is actually also asking for that analysis period, so this again you want to look at um, maybe for uh, um, the entire year. So I'm going to do analysis, ladybug analysis period. So basically defaults to the very start of the year to the end. And let's see, I think annual hourly data so it says you can also add um, things yeah like wind speed I guess even though you have it there so there's a lot that goes into the psychometric chart um, the other thing to be aware of too is that there's again to bake it and also to run it so again because it's got a lot of information um, it doesn't want it to have to reprocess each time so I'm gonna use this boolean toggle to run it and it does come out much smaller and I'm gonna turn this one off and as you can see here is our psychometric chart and for those of you who aren't familiar with it basically it's looking at all those conditions it's mapping out the humidity ratio the uh, temperature the uh, barometric pressure here and it kind of just tells us um, when those conditions are suitable and you can see that for this type of climate basically anything within this uh, deep bar is considered comfortable so um, it and the colors depict how often it is like that so in areas between uh, looks like for relative humidity so pretty low humidity uh, and so zero percent to twenty percent or I would even say zero percent to thirty percent um, between the temperatures of looks like 72 and a half up to 80 degrees can be considered uh, comfortable and obviously the uh, cooler it gets the less comfortable so it pretty much has a range where you can get to less than seven degrees close to like 68 degrees as long as the temperature or sorry as long as the uh, humidity is kind of high so the lower the humidity, uh, the lower the temperature needs to be. If it's uh, cooler temperatures, the humidity can be a little bit higher and still be comfortable. You can see that 
once you get to that 90%, it's never really comfortable. Rarely with 80%. So um, that's how we can start to um, read this chart. And again, we can always set up all sorts of different conditional statements as well. Um, so I'm going to show you also now another chart. Again, you can apply that same idea with the color gradient to edit that and uh, mess around with it. I'm going to look at a couple more things. I'll look at now the uh, ladybug windrows. So again, we're looking at what it needs. So hourly wind direction. So here's wind direction, hourly wind speed. Um, I don't know why these are crisscrossing. I'm kind of, I don't know why they didn't just put them in the order that they should have been. Again, it needs out annually, annual hourly data. So any other additional information. So again, rarely is wind speed itself, um, wind speed and direction. Um, aren't really that useful as a standalone thing. So you can include other things like humidity, air temperature, those things start to make um, a more interesting uh, discussion. And then the analysis period, we can even kind of detail how much directions there are in this wind speed. So again, I'm gonna use the analysis period here. And then I'm also gonna use this to run it. Oh, and it's done. I just need to actually turn it on. So here's what our wind rows uh, looks like. Um, and again, like it's actually the speed is in meters. So we can also, again, convert that by going to extra. Uh, let's see. I believe they have it. So. Uh, meters per second to miles per hour, so that's most likely what we want, right? So what is this saying here? Meters per second. So we'll just replace that one. <clears throat> So it does take a second, but. Okay, so now we got miles per hour. So now we can see that it gets up to 46 miles per hour. Um, and what's cool is that it starts to tell you a little more information too. So it's calm for uh, less than 12% of the time. So it's rarely um, really calm weather. Um, What's interesting too, so again, like uh, it matters a lot whether that temperature is hot or cold outside. So that's why I always like to also include our dry bulb temperature. So let's also include this as annual hourly data. So now what you'll see is it creates a whole nother wind rose. And instead of just looking at it for wind speed, it's still using this to kind of indicate the direction um, and frequency in which it happens. But now it's also associating uh, the temperature with it too. So now we can see that um, we have that. And here's where you wanna start to say, okay, like when is it Maybe I just want to know when it's either happening over the winter time, so you can actually change the analysis period to those months, 
or you could actually do it with um, the uh, temperatures associated with that. So this is where you kind of, again, create conditional statements. This gives a good explanation too. Um, earlier it said, we just looked at how A is greater or less than a value. In this case, it's good to keep in mind uh, that every time you add um, data to this, you have to go sequentially down the alphabet. So now it could be, um, so this says to use this input correctly, hourly data. So the something we just added, which is in fact, uh, temperature or humidity must be plugged into the hourly data. The conditional statement input here should be a valid conditional statement in Python, such as A is less than 25 or B is, uh, or sorry, A is greater than 25, B is less than 80. Um, down here it says to visualize the hourly data only lowercase, blah, blah, blah. Um, and each letter alphabetically corresponds to each of the lists in their respective order. So A always represents the first list, B always represents the second list. Um, I wish it told us which one was actually list A, so let's just try. I know it's not, um, maybe it is, so let's try just A. So A, oops, A, is let's look for warm a is greater than uh 75 or let's go up to like 85 and we'll know if it needs to be a or b in a second so nope i don't like that so it looks like a needs to or it needs to be b You can never keep track of which letter it needs to be. It might actually need to be C, because it might be A, B, and then C. But we'll find out in a second. Uh, yep, okay, so B acts as um, that conditional statement. And it does it for both. Um, so you can see again, like when um, when temperatures are, so that warmer temperatures, those are always coming kind of from the uh, southwest, um, ranging in this uh, speed. Again, these are the kind of temperature ranges for that. So that kind of tells us where our warm air is coming from. So let's do um, B is less than 65. So when is that, where is that cold air coming from? All right, so now we can see the majority of that colder air is faster speeds. Um, um, but yeah, so like I said, there's all sorts of ways to start to kind of parse this data out and filter it to you, accommodate the needs that you're looking for. Um, so that'll be it. There's other things that we'll get to at some point, such as uh, solar orientation, um, that's pretty comprehensive as well. So I think it's important to dedicate one um, video for that as well. But this should just kind of get you started up at kind of inventorying the different weather information.